Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and today we're going to talk about books. And by we, I mean me. I will talk about books. But Grim, why would you want to talk about something made from paper? When has paper ever been interesting? And the answer is because I want to, and always. More importantly, it's taken many months, but I've finally reached The Crippled God, the final book in the Malazan Book of the Fallen series. I plan to review the whole series once I'm done with The Crippled God, but I realized that before I do that, I wanted to discuss how I approach books, things I like, dislike, and things I personally value. This way, when I do talk about the Malazan series, I won't need to repeat myself. Spoilers. I will most likely repeat myself. Double spoilers. In this video, I will talk about a lot of books and series. Some I have finished, some I haven't, and some I never will. One of those that I never will includes Game of Thrones. So if you're curious about why I dislike Game of Thrones, then this is the video for you. So let's get to it. I'm going to start with the smaller stuff first, and that first thing I want to talk about is language. Now, for regular everyday readers, no one considers language when reading a mass market book. We aren't looking for poetry, and chances are there's nothing special going on. I believe that's the correct approach to take. Writing should be neutral. So long as the prose is fluid and non-offensive, then you've already passed the first hurdle, which is not pissing off the reader from the get-go. Trying to write in a unique way has an extremely high chance of backfiring, and in my opinion is not worth attempting. It doesn't matter how interesting your plot or characters are, if trying to read it is a chore or annoying. My best example is R. Scott Baker's Prince of Nothing series. Fun fact, I had to go dig through my many boxes of books to find this one because I couldn't remember the name of the book or the author, but I did remember the front cover. I'll be honest, I don't know that much about it. In fact, I don't think I ever made it past the first 30 pages. I tried reading it years ago, and all I remember is that it was arduous, annoying, and not worth the effort of trying to get through it. I put it down and never regretted it. Googling it now, I see he's a philosopher, so that may explain his unique style of writing. Either way, I never figured out what the series was about, since I couldn't get into it to begin with. In the same vein, I'd say the Karkonas trilogy by Steven Erickson suffers the same problem. I'm openly admitting I haven't read any of it, nor do I own it. There are a lot of offshoot books from the Malazan series, and I was searching for which series to read next, whether it's the short stories, Esselmont's novels in the same world, or the Karkonas trilogy. Now, I'll be honest, it was most likely never going to be the Karkonas trilogy, since it hasn't been fully released yet, and one thing I did learn reading the Malazan series is that it's best to read it all in one go, lest you forget plot points or characters, since there are a lot of them. But while I was reading people's opinion of the series, one thing did keep popping out to me, which was that they mentioned the prose used by Erickson in the trilogy, and that it may turn people off. The very fact that the prose is mentioned is an immediate red flag to me, since when hearing people's opinions of books, it is extremely rare for people to throw prose to the fore. Now, I have no insider knowledge, and it's entirely possible that readers just don't really care about the Tist. I'm one of them. I never really cared about the Tist history. While I did enjoy some of their characters, I preferred them as a race staying in the background for the most part. The age of the Tist is over. But I sincerely doubt people who went through over 11,000 pages of an epic would refuse to even attempt reading a short trilogy about a background race. Heck, I'm not a big fan of the Tist, but I still plan to read it. So the writing style. It gets brought up a lot, and one Reddit comment compares it to a modern-day Shakespearean tragedy, and many more comments make statements along the lines of, the most beautiful prose he's written to date, and an absolute masterpiece of prose. And yet... The series is on hold because it turns out that sales for the Karkonas trilogy were terrible. In fact, Steven Erickson himself didn't even realize sales were bad until his publisher told him while he was writing the third book, so he dropped it and instead started focusing on writing the Karsa Orlong trilogy. I'm no genius, but sales must be really bleak for a publisher to encourage you to stop writing a book and start something else, especially when you're already working on the final book of a trilogy and the only thing I can think of is that the prose turns off the majority of readers. If your book isn't enjoyable to read, people will not read it in their leisure time. I said it at the start, but it bears repeating. It doesn't matter how interesting your plot or characters are if reading the book is a chore. Thinking on it further, I can personally think of only one series in which I can say the writing style has succeeded and actually improved the reading experience for me, and that's The King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. I recall reading a review years ago, and I'm afraid I don't remember where, but the woman essentially boiled her review down to the most beautifully written novel with nothing happening. Now, the first thing I'll say is that I don't agree with that review. 
I got loads of enjoyment out of the novels, but it was the first time I ever considered the book to be beautifully written, and I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Many people say Shakespeare is written beautifully, and while that may be true, it's not something I go to for enjoyment. I don't enjoy muddling through archaic dialogue. To me, something beautifully written is something that is fluid, easy to read, and imparts meaning without even trying. I don't need pages of philosophical diatribes, and honestly, for the most part, I read them and forget them immediately. To date, The King Killer Chronicles is the only series that I can definitively point to and say, this is extremely well written, uniquely written, and in a way that does not tax your mind to absorb. Now, I'm not reviewing The King Killer Chronicles here, but I do want to have a quick aside because I have opinions. I love The Name of the Wind and have reread it quite a few times. I even went so far as to buy the 10th anniversary edition, and dang, it's nice. But Wise Man's Fear? Ugh. While I'll cherry pick parts to reread here or there, on the whole, The Wise Man's Fear is a much weaker book. Side side note, The Wise Man's Fear is the only novel I've read to date where there's a character who shares my name with the exact same spelling. I'll admit I'm one of those people who does not care about Denna. I'm all for reading about Quoth and his journey, and that includes Denna being a part of it, but the focus on her is so prevalent that I have no desire to reread it. The second part is that the reproduction of the Atom, with them believing men play no part in making babies, was just so stupid it threw me out of the book. I found their culture interesting and enjoyed how they considered other cultures barbaric, but for them to consider themselves so advanced but not realize men play a part in baby making? I can't accept that. Now as a final note on that, I know many people have put forward explanations and validations, and if that helps you, then great. I still won't accept it. Many people like to point to the fact that we as humans didn't understand how babies were made until 1875, but let me be clear here. We didn't know the specifics in regards to sperm and eggs. We still understood that it took a man and a woman to make a baby. Here's a picture of a piece from the Catalhoyuk archaeological site. Sorry, I know I probably butchered the pronunciation. This thing is dated 6000 to 5500 BC and shows a woman lying with a man and then a woman lying with a child. Even if they didn't know the specifics, they still understood it took a man and a woman to make a baby. I hate that Patrick Rothfuss added that tidbit into the story. I know that he added it to make Quoth express disbelief and to have a cultural clash, but it was so unbelievably stupid that it came all the way out of the page and slapped me to the other side of Saturn completely killed the Atom Arc for me. I'll still read the next book, and I'm excited for it, but dang does it have a lot to prove. But anyways, back to books. If I were to sum it up, I would say make the book be competently written. I don't think Jim Butcher's Dresden Files is breathtakingly written, but I'm not in it for the language, I'm in it for the story. I doubt many people would be put off by the way he writes. On that same note, I'm not very forgiving of spelling and grammar errors. I am reading a professionally published novel. You have editors and proofreaders. I should not consistently find errors in your writing. I'll admit while my tolerance for these mistakes is low, with the most egregious offender of recent memory being a Warhammer 40k book in which the planet they're on is spelled incorrectly on the back cover, I'm more forgiving the further apart these errors are. If there are multiple errors one after another, I can only assume your editor is terrible, you're terrible, and the publisher doesn't have much faith in you, so they don't spend as much time or resources on you. You come across as amateurish. Spellcheck can't find everything. Even Steven Erickson's Malazan series has a couple errors in it, but I'm much more willing to forgive it when there are, say, two mistakes over a 1,200-page book. So, there are many types of books. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that. While I tend towards fiction, sci-fi, and fantasy, I'm not averse to other things if they strike my fancy. But if you couldn't tell from the previous examples I gave, I'll mostly be focusing on sci-fi and fantasy. So let's jump in. For the most part, novels are trying to tell a story. There are many ways to tell it, but on the whole I'm going to simplify by saying you have characters and the book follows them as they go along. Now it's possible to have it all follow a single character or jump between many. A book like The King Killer Chronicles follows both and his daily life and its struggles. Okay, to clarify, there's two parts to the story, and there are occasions where the storytelling takes place in the bar, which is done from the perspective of the chronicler, but 95% of the novel is all about Quoth. Stuff happens in the world, but we only get to see what he sees. The same can be said for Harry Dresden from The Dresden Files. We are always attached to Harry and can only follow him as he goes along solving mysteries and fighting monsters. 
Having one character may be simplistic, but it's also the safest. Do you like Foth and Harry as characters? Good. Then chances are that for any sequels you'll have no trouble picking it up and reading it because you're invested in the character. But books can also be a bit like movies. Maybe you want the reader to have knowledge that the protagonist doesn't have, whether it be context or to help raise the stakes for an inevitable clash. Maybe the book will bounce between the protagonist on a journey to get a MacGuffin to stop the antagonist, but we also get chapters from the perspective of the antagonist as he organizes his dastardly plan. While we may not necessarily be invested in the antagonist as a character, this viewpoint can help us fully appreciate the scope of the conflict and the stakes for the climax. But I will say this. The more character perspectives you add to your novels, the higher the likelihood that it will end up dropped or the reader will lose interest. Or at least for me. I'm much more likely to be invested in a plot if I like the characters as opposed to remaining invested in a plot for plot's sake if I hate all the characters in said plot. They can still be interesting and realistic characters, but if I can't find one I like, then why am I still reading it? Why should I care about this epic and the consequences for the world if I don't care about the people inhabiting said world? Now the level that a novel breaks is different for each person, and for each story. For instance, when I started the Malazan series, I hated the Malazans and couldn't wait for them to get murdered, but over time I came to like them. The same can be said for certain Letharii characters. My point is that I want to make a distinction between character-focused stories and epics. Technically, if you Google epics, it says they're long narrative poems, but novels aren't what people consider poems, so just ignore the poem part. What's important is that epics are large, sweeping works which involve a long time span, high stakes, involve countries interacting, and overall has a large backstory or universe setting. The Malazan series involves many people across a large span of time, none of which are central but all contribute in their own essential way. Compare that to, say, the Dresden Files, where Harry Dresden is the central focus. But it's very easy for an epic to fail. And now we're going to talk about Game of Thrones. So, back when the show first released, everyone started talking about how great it was and how good the books are. I just happened to be walking through chapters when I saw they had a buy three, get one free deal, so I picked up the first four novels, and boy, do I regret it. I despised Game of Thrones. I never finished the first book. I got about 272 pages into the book, only to discover that the only person I was interested in was Jon and what was going on at the Wall. I didn't care about anyone else and when I went looking for when he next appeared and realized I had to read 170 pages to then get 8 pages of John, followed by another 70 pages for another 8 pages, it just wasn't worth it to me. It didn't help that the first book has a 35-page appendix with character names and occupations. It doesn't take very long before you're tired of stopping every page only to flip to the back to figure out who a character is. The Malazan Book of the Fallen shares this flaw. But at least in Malazan, if you take the appendix from the first two books, which have very little character overlap, it only comes to 9 pages total. When you fill your world with so many named characters, it becomes very easy to start looking for which characters are quote-unquote important, and which are side fluff. And woe on you if a character you thought was unimportant turns out to be anything but, and you can't remember who he is or where you met him. I just started The Crippled God, and in the first 60 pages met a character I couldn't remember for the life of me. Turns out he'd first appeared in book 8 and didn't appear again until now. I had to stop reading and look him up online to remember that. Any time you need to stop reading the book in order to look a character up, I feel like the book has failed in some small measure. Like if you're watching a movie and need to pause every few minutes. It ruins the flow and the total package is diminished. I will say that Malazan is the worst I've read though, with many characters being seen in the first book, not appearing again until the 8th. I can't comment on A Song of Ice and Fire since I never made it past the first book. What A Song of Ice and Fire has may be worth it to a lot of people, but for me it just wasn't worth my time. That's why the larger your story gets, the more dramatic in scope, the easier it is to have the whole thing become diluted and harder to grasp. Single character focused novels are easier for the reader to follow, and I argue easier to get invested in. I say easier, but it's important to note that easier does not mean better, but it also doesn't mean worse. Kevin Hearn has released a series of novels known as the Iron Druid Chronicles. I'll openly admit I have no respect for his books and I find them trash, though that wasn't always the case. 
it wasn't until the seventh book in the series that I deemed it a write-off, and I may one day do a video about just how stupid and bad that series is. The point is that for those who don't know, they're essentially short, easy-to-read fantasy novels comparable in a way to the Dresden Files. Unfortunately, as the series continued on and the amount of characters increased, instead of continuing to have the series from the perspective of the Iron Druid, he started dividing it between more and more characters. If I recall correctly, by the time I gave up, it was divided among the Iron Druid, his love interest, his teacher, and I think even a few chapters from the perspective of his dog. But his books never got any longer. They stayed at roughly 350 pages each. Now that's fine for telling a story for the Iron Druid, but when you're suddenly jumping among three or four characters in a single book, instead of being able to tell a fulfilling story of the Iron Druid, you instead have made a bunch of short stories with each character getting maybe 100 pages total. You've diluted your book and made it worse. And if the plots aren't connected, you haven't even made a coherent story. Speaking of how many characters you have, I also want to point out another gripe. Chapters. As far as I'm aware, there's never been a set rule for what constitutes a chapter. I personally believe a chapter should be able to be completed in at most a 20 or 30 minute sitting. That seems to generally be the case, and in my opinion gives a good reading experience with a natural break for people to put the book down. And before you get in my face, yes, I do know bookmarks exist, and I said a natural break. Chapters work as great breaks in a story and can help keep it focused in your mind. To this day, I can still remember the first six chapters in the first Harry Potter book based on where it breaks in the story. And when I reread a Dresden File book, I can easily search out the scenes I need relatively quickly thanks to events being restricted to chapters. With epics and lots of characters, it's quite common for that to be thrown out the window. I know I said I don't like A Song of Ice and Fire, but at least those books have their chapters done by character, so if you wanted to reread a John event or an Arya event, it should be simple to find. Then you have the other books, like the Sword of Truth series. This series will jump you between multiple characters in multiple places in the world within the same chapter. Want clarification for something? Well, good luck searching through the whole book because the chapters sure won't help you find something. Malazan Book of the Fallen? Average chapter length is somewhere around 50 pages. 50 freaking pages. And in that one chapter, you will jump between characters incessantly, all doing different things, none of which are related, and good luck if you ever need to try and go back for clarification. I wanted to check a minor event and was lucky enough to remember which book it was. For the record, it was the recollection made by Silchus Ruin, I believe, when he's traveling over the Blue Mountains and remembers a tribe called the Snake, maybe? Or they had tails like a snake. Either way, it's a short dialogue of their last moments and then a god coming down too late to save them. I wanted to reread it because I couldn't remember if it was important or not. I have no clue where to find it. I know it's in Reaper's Gale, but that's all the help I get. I would literally need to comb the entire 1200 page book because chapters are worthless. Chances are there's a Silchus Ruin bit in every single chapter of the book. These are 1200 page books with 24 chapters total. For comparison, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, a 223 page book, has 17 chapters. It's ridiculous. I don't feel like I'm asking for much. Just a clear way to differentiate aspects of your novel so if needed I can easily come back to it later. I thought that was what chapters were there to help do, but clearly not. It baffles me. Odds are I'm never going to go back looking through those books because even if I wanted to, I would never be able to find the important events I was looking for. But you know what? If I wanted to reread any important event in Harry Potter, I probably could. Any of the tasks in the Goblet of Fire? Well, how convenient. They're titled The First Task, The Second Task, and The Third Task in large font at the top of the chapter. A 636-page book with 37 chapters. Are chapters and titles not supposed to be a feature of convenience? If you're just going to put them in arbitrarily, why have them at all? I'm legitimately curious. The Name of the Wind at least has titles for its chapters, even though they're mostly flowery and obtuse, but Malazan, the large, sweeping, complex, and interconnected epic? No, just call it Chapter 1, Chapter 2, etc., all the way to 24 and move on. What a waste of my time. These are literally the types of books that need descriptive chapter names more than any other. Also, a lot more chapters. I feel like an editor should have pointed this out. That, or there's some secret deep meaning to his chapter divides that I haven't grasped. 
and even if it were pointed out to me, I'd still be pissed off because it makes the reading experience worse. To close out this video, I will say that when I go to a bookstore, I generally browse the shelves for anything interesting. Many times I've picked up a book because it intrigued me, and then I've gone on to read more from the series or author. Here I'd point to Daryl Gregory. Every single one of his books to date is a self-contained story that has no impact on any other. This also means that some books are way better than others, but it's entirely reliant on the plot of the books. We have a story of people getting possessed by made-up characters, a story of a town that suddenly mutates into creatures, a zombie story, a story of people using a drug to see God, and so on, each one unique. But it can also create situations that make me not want to read as much as I had been previously. It takes a lot for me to give up on a series. If something is average or subpar, I'll generally keep reading even if I don't consider it super interesting because I've always put forward the time to get acquainted with the story and characters and want to see how it plays out. For instance, I started the Witcher series and my god, the two novels full of short stories, The Last Wish and Sword of Destiny, these books, which encompass the short stories, are amazing. They truly make you feel what it's like to live in the world of the Witcher. But all the subsequent books, which are single plot, I give them a resounding eh. Let me be clear, they aren't bad. But if you were to ask me where Sapkowski's true strength lies, I'd answer the short stories in a heartbeat. His long-form six-book series story can't even compare, but I'm already locked in, and while I do find the books lesser, I'm still interested in seeing where it goes. And this brings me to the danger I mentioned earlier of going into an epic. Epics generally require the reader to go in knowing that it is a large time investment and that they may be lost and confused at the start. That's the one thing I heard over and over again in terms of Malazan. You get dropped straight into the world, and you won't know what's going on, but stick with it because it's great. It actually created a situation where I read the first book, liked it, but didn't start the second immediately afterwards. I didn't come back to the series until a couple years later, and by that point I couldn't remember who certain characters were and restarted from scratch. Now, that wasn't so bad, it was only the first book, and the shortest one at that, but what if I had put it down to the fourth book? Would I had restarted? Tried muddling through regardless? Given up entirely? These large epics are a real time investment, and you need to be prepared going in and give them the time they deserve in order to get the most out of them. I cannot even begin to imagine what it would have been like reading that series as it was released. Going by the publishing dates, most of the books were released within a year or a year and a half of the previous, which isn't bad, but it's still a year needing to keep all the plot in order. But that's all I've got in regards to my gripes with books. When I do finish The Cripple God, I'll be doing a full deep dive into the Malazan Book of the Fallen, so look forward to that. Thanks for listening, and have a good day.